Welcome to the Pine Talk, episode 10, where we tend to. Ah, uh, what's this? Is that the vampire fang unceremoniously entering my home and trying to suck all of my personal data info? I want to suck your personal information. Not on my clock, or pine time, as the case may be. <laughs> you can't you hide can't forever. Ever, 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 ever. Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> Protecting yourself using cameras, are we? Just gotta boop boop my way to the back door and... What? Where is he? Damn it! Why can't we see him? He's using a pine cube, sir. It's free and open source software and he set it up in a secure fashion. Ah, you win this one. Good. I shook him, but not for long. Fang's got eyes and ears all around the world, but I should be safe here at the Pine Tree HQ. I need to let Peter know that this is where we are meeting. That way Fang won't uh, catch us off guard. Let me just uh, take a selfie real quick using my Pine phone. Send it to him. Let's meet here with the coordinates. There we go. Where is he hiding? Knowing what we know do from his socials, he's probably sending someone a selfie of where he is. Excellent! But unless he shares that information publicly, he's probably taking selfies using megapixels and relaying it privately in an encrypted fashion to his friends using Matrix. Ark, why are you so worthless? To be continued? I am Peter, your Linux phone tweeter. And I am Ezra, content creator who learned to draw. And welcome to the 10th episode of Pine Talk, the podcast for the Pine64 community by members of the Pine64 community. In this episode, we will be having an interview, we will discuss some community news, and our homework, <laughs> and some more uh, feedback and questions. But first, what have we been up to lately? Well, I've been working a lot on my point and click adventure game. It's nearly done. Development will cease June 22nd. Release will be either on that date or shortly after, just to fix a few bugs. The game will be, of course, open source, so you can make fun of my horrifying code. It's a <laughs> mysterious adventure filled with a handful of mini games, a short story, and a minimal amount of moon logic. Once the game is released, uh, I might have some fun and see if I can port it uh, to to the Pine Phone, just just for the giggles. I um, I also have been taking some time to learn how to draw. Nothing too crazy, but uh, I've been getting better. Just thought I'd uh, share that very interesting information. More relevantly, I played a whole bunch with my Pine Cube. It was really fun. I learned a lot, and yeah, I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the episode. Sounds great. And I've seen some of your drawings. They're not too bad. Well, thank you. I've been um, writing that modem firmware install guide article thingy, as I promised. It took me longer than I thought. And I, I only could do it after I decided, well, I, I won't write about Minicom here. I will use something else. And mm -hmm. then it went quite smoothly. Then I moved my weekly updates on all things Linux phone to Wednesdays for personal reasons. Uh, this is great. Now I actually have uh, a free weekend every then and now. <laughs> uh, you know, every second That's week. That's important. That's nice. I hope it will improve my life. Mm -hmm. And I managed to do a video about installing GlowDroid, this uh, little Android distribution for the Pine Phone and other devices like some other A64 powered systems and the Raspberry Pi, I think. It's mainly a little tutorial explaining how to do it. And uh, initial comments include why, why, 
and why. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how it goes. But let's get to it now and start with the up of the episode. And my pick for this episode is Web Archives. It's a reader for Web Archives, like those Kivix files and stuff, that offers you the ability to browse offline millions of articles from large community projects such as Wikipedia or Wikisource. It's written in Vala. The UI is done with the use of GTK and Lipendi, and it's being built with Mizen and Ninja, or you can just install it from FlatUp because there's a flat pack available. Just try it, download some Kivix files, and learn something. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not super crazy and special, but it's certainly something, and uh, it's the best option for that that we currently have. So I liked it a mm-hmm. lot, and I figured, why not talk about this? Because I'm sure that there are some people looking for this, and maybe some of you listening are looking for an app along these lines, and then you can find the link in our show notes and install it. And now, let's continue with a special treat. We've interviewed Martijn Bram, whom you may know from his involvement in Postmarket OS and his apps, including, but not limited to, Megapixels. Megapixels! So, hello Martin, how are you? And who are you? I'm good, and I am Martijn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of the lead developers of Postmark OS and the infrastructure maintainer. And I just write a lot of Linux software. Good. Okay, so how did you get started with computing and also with Linux? Because maybe that wasn't at the same time, right? It was not. I didn't start on Linux. I started on Windows 98. And that was on some donated computer, no internet connection, of course. And there I started programming in HTML, as far as you can call it programming. Yeah, writing markup language. (laughs) Yeah, because I I didn't have internet, so I made the folder uh, C uh, colon slash www and made my own websites in that. And it was just like I had internet. <laughs> so that's where I started uh, the basic basics of uh, computer programming. And after that, I started to pick up some PHP on a new computer when I moved to Windows 2000. At that point, I I think it was that computer I got a Knopic CD. It was quite nice. I ran some tools, and one of those tools was uh, G Disks, and I could rename my disk because it could create a new label. And at that point, I did not understand that creating a new label was creating a new file system. So, <laughs> within seconds, all my data was gone. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so that that was my first Linux experience. Okay, mm, but you still kept at it. Um, no, I threw <laughs> away all the Linux stuff for a few years. And later, um, it was around Windows Vista. I tried Linux again, run Ubuntu on my laptop for school and never stopped using Linux and slowly started migrating away from all the Windows tooling I've used. Yeah, that's quite relatable. I think many people share this. Yeah. Yep. It's. Not just because Vista was not great, because I still think Vista is not the worst operating system Windows has made or Microsoft has made. But it was more that the laptop I used was not great and it just ran a lot better with Linux. And I was in school, so I ran Linux because it was cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and now you use Linux full time? Basically, yes. I have multiple machines running mm-hmm. and most of them have uh, Linux on them, and one has Windows on it for games mm-hmm. and Discord. Mm. It's it's basically the one box that I keep all my proprietary software. Mm-hmm. The proprietary machine. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yep. Awesome. 
How did you get involved with post market OS? Um, quite early on when the project started, which is now slightly more than four years ago. It was, um, that was actually on a national holiday. So we were on vacation in uh, Germany and I was bored and was browsing Reddit and found a post by Oliver that showed uh, him running his own Linux distribution on two phones. And that was just very exciting because I've tried before to make something similar and couldn't make it work. And saw some cool tech demos like uh, Lima development on the Nexus 4, I think. And I wanted to do that, but it, it's very hard to get into. And at that moment, I was quite annoyed. I didn't bring any phones with me. So when I got back home that weekend, I got all the phones I uh, found in the, ho- in, in the house here. All, all the discarded phones and try to port postmarked vests to them. Okay. And the first successful one was the Nexus 5. And this was also at the time where the whole project was run by Oliver only. Uh, and after a week of that, we had a matrix channel and I became the second maintainer of Postmarked West and got permissions to merge things because sometimes Oliver had to sleep and I was awake. So that, that helped a lot with the throughput of, of getting stuff merged. Wow. And yeah, that has grown slowly into the current team we have now. Yeah, most of the team we have now is actually there since the start, that first week. And most of the People that weren't there from the the first week were there from the blog post that was made after that, 100 Days of Postmarked West. Mm-hmm. It was a very popular one. Yeah, I think I recall this announcement. And I was also excited, but I also knew that I didn't really have the skills to contribute. I had other priorities in life at that point, but I, I remember that. And it was really exciting for me, too. Yeah, it's- it was awesome to go, an awesome way to get starting with uh, embedded Linux development. Yeah, and I mean the infrastructure you've built there around tools like PM Bootstrap. I mean, it's just amazing, right? Yeah, well, that's basically at that point was all made by Oliver, and he was working for it about a year before that the first blog, blog post by him got published, and yeah. It's it's amazing piece of software, and it's also something I've tried to build before but failed because the scope is quite large. When did you first hear of Pine sixty four or the Pine phone? I think I've heard from Pine sixty four uh, from random news articles about. Um, I guess I've seen news about the original Pine book, and of course the cheap uh, development board they made but I never really paid attention to those uh, news articles because at that point it was Raspberry Pi or nothing, basically. Yeah. And the first time I really got started on Pine64 stuff was when uh, a few team members of Postmarked West were on Academy and met uh, TL Lim. And he was like, oh, you guys are working on something with phones. Um, we have a development kit for you. And we, and Oliver made an issue in the issue tracker if anyone wanted a free development kit to do some phone stuff. And I commented to uh, send me one if there's anything left. And I got the Anakin dev kit. And after that, I just keep receiving prototypes. So that's really quite early on, I guess, right? Yep, that was uh, quite a while before the phone project with Pine64 was actually announced. I remember seeing those images of this box, basically big white box, uh, yep. here and there uh, on the internet. I think uh, UbiPort guys had these early on too. Um, yes, UbiPort, um, Postmarked West got a few. I don't exactly remember who all got them. I knew uh, the UiPort guys made the first repository with a kernel that booted on that stuff. 
And a lot of the distributions that are available now are from after the Braveheart editions got released. Speaking of phones, <laughs> you have developed an impressive number of apps for the Pine Phone and Postmarket OS by now, from megapixels to the a power supply app. Uh, yeah. Do you have any tips or lessons learned for uh, people who would like to do the same? Just start writing applications. I basically uh, wanted something to quickly see the values of uh, power management uh, things in Linux. This, so that's when I wrote Power Supply. And it's basically my first GTK application. And that whole thing forced me to actually learn how to make a graphical application in Linux. And I revised that code base last week because I've learned quite a lot of developments for GTK applications on the way. And that one was falling a bit behind. Now it actually fits on the Pine Phone in both orientations, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Impressive. There's surprisingly, a surprisingly small number of apps that do that. That's true. Yeah, I have not really tested most of my applications in landscape orientation, but due to the keyboard, I figured out that I really needed to fix that. Cool. So where do you get the ideas or inspiration for your apps is it just scratching a niche like i want this so let me get started um exactly yes all the apps i've wrote are apps i needed at that exact moment and there was nothing available that i liked so i made something new cool and if people want to develop new apps uh what are areas that need new apps or uh, do you think? It depends a lot on what you use. I wrote the apps I'm missing from my Android phone and all the things that are left are things that will take a lot of work to reverse engineer other protocols to implement a new app for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, if you want to figure out what you can write an app for, just pick up your current phone and see what's missing on the Pine phone. <laughs> That shouldn't be too hard. I've seen people uh, complain of a lot about what's missing. Yeah. And it also depends on how much uh, of an app hoarder you are on Android. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So do you have any plans for future apps? So I think that's new apps, but also uh, major improvements or additional features for the apps you've created. Um, I'm still expanding postmark those tweaks with new things. Um, I've added a settings page for controlling the style of the disk unlocker on postmark OS. And I've added an about page. So it, it basically shows the same thing as GNOME settings. It shows an about page, but some more details about hardware. Because on ARM systems, it can't really tell what's processor is in there because uh, GNOME settings and I think also the control center in Plasma Mobile both read proc CPU info and just dump the CPU name from there which works fine on x86 systems because it contains the name of your CPU but on ARM you need to parse the IDs that are below that and make a lookup table for it mm. and there are quite a few things that don't really uh, map correctly on ARM platforms. So I made the about page on Postmark just fix to show it all correctly. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. And it also has some hardware uh, specific things. Like if you're running on the Pine phone, it can show you the current memory frequency because you can flash other U boot uh, images with other overclock speeds. Mm -hmm. If people want to help out, uh, Postmark, Postmark at OS says, uh, as you do, or become an active part of the post-market OS community, how can they best accomplish that? If you want to help on something that's PinePhone specific, you can probably take a look at the issue tracker and find an issue and try to work on that. There are 
there are some things that are quite easy to fix on there, but nobody has time yet to look into it. And some things are quite hard and need specific knowledge. But if you have that knowledge, you can obviously help. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want to do something specifically uh, Pine phone related, you can find an old phone and go through the porting guide. It should walk you through the complete process of running some Linux system on existing Android hardware at least. Hmm. Let's shift a bit and ask a quite personal question. Uh, what does an average day l- look like for you? Well, I wake up, have breakfast, open my email and go through all the GitLab emails that are there and delete them and figure <laughs> out what else important was in the mailbox. Then I just pick a random project and go work on that. It's not very organized. But it gets the job done. <laughs> yep. And another shift. So um, we've been talking mostly about software, uh, a little bit about Project Anakin, right? But um, otherwise, mostly about software. So you've already mentioned it. Uh, you have a developer unit of that upcoming PinePhone keyboard. So how is it? How do you like it? It's a really interesting product. The developer unit I have is not really usable because the firmware doesn't report all the keys and mechanically the keys are not really nice to type on. And with not really nice, I mean unusable. You have to press them down really hard to actually make something work. Once those mechanical issues are fixed, it should be a really, really nice way to interact with the PinePhone. And since I have the developer kit, I have been able to figure out how to make it interface with the Pine phone with some minimal kernel changes. And yeah, yeah, it just works. Hmm. Great. So it's already like almost plug and play. It's almost plug and play. Um, it uses the I squared C hit interface, which was something I think designed by Microsoft for their hardware, which just tunnels the or a normal HIT uh, interfaces over I2C. So the only thing that needed to be added to the PinePhone kernel was defining that there is a HIT device on the BOGO pins at a specific address, and Linux will figure it out the rest. Oh, cool. Hmm. I believe you made um, a video about the uh, PinePhone keyboard, because I remember... Uh seeing you talk about certain of the issues you just brought up. Yep. If anybody wants to um, follow your work and what you do, uh, what is the best way that they can do that? Some stuff I publish on YouTube, some stuff I have on Libri. And if it's something that's extensive and better written as text, it's on my blog. We'll be sure to uh, to link those uh various resources in the show notes and maybe in the description if possible. So all that's left is uh, to thank you so much for your time for this interview and generally uh, to what you're doing uh, to progress uh, Linux on mobile phones. It's really appreciated. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. It's fun to appear on another podcast for uh, <laughs> for a chance. Yeah, right. So that's another thing uh, you guys should totally listen to the post marketers podcast just subscribe to it it's pretty great thanks again to martin for coming on we will have all the important links in the show note now let's go on with the community news on the pine 64 blog they talked about this thing called fem2 star their their post was fem2 star taking aim for the stars We'll uh, have a link in the show notes. It's uh, something, something space with satellites. More seriously, uh, I quote, Femtostar is working towards creating a satellite constellation for open and private communications around the globe. Their satellites, as well as ground infrastructure, run open source software atop of open hardware. The system can be accessed without needing to go through an official gateway, and anyone is welcome to review the source code file or the source files as well as the code. 
For them to stars, Vision is one of privacy, respecting, and net neutral mobile satellite service that can be accessed by anyone, anywhere, at any time. Which I think sounds very cool. I think it could be, you know, that that's something that 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 is hard to replace in, in our current world. So perhaps Femme de Star can can be useful uh, to for for that kind of information. Definitely, it sounds interesting. I don't really see a use case in my personal life right now. But then again, if you have one, more power to you. In other community news, Maggie, the PinePhone kernel developer, wrote another update on kernel development progress for the PinePhone over the past two months when he published his last update on this. He added some patches from others and worked on more things himself. Improvements include automatic shutdown of CPU cores when idle, called CPU idle, automatic DRAM downclocking, a time travel avoidance fix, so you hopefully don't end up in 2116 or 2116 anymore. All these three patches were done by Samuel. And patches by Journey that improve sound of a HDMI. Maggie himself patched the touchscreen controller driver so it uses less power during sleep. And worked on more power management related things. Some of the many improvements, make sure to read his post, have already landed in his 5.12 kernel and thus distributions. I think they are in Arch Linux ARM and Manjaro already. Others are still being tested in 5.13, which, to quote Megi, should be working quite well already. I am certainly grateful for his continued hard work on the PinePhone kernel, so thank you, Megi, for all your hard work. It's duly appreciated. Mm, indeed. And with that, let's move on to community engagement and discuss our self-assigned homework from last episode. <laughs> Ezra, your homework was all about the Pine Cube. Yes, and I've done quite a lot with it, though I have plans to do more. So I started by installing Armbian without a screen onto the Pine Cube, which sounds more impressive uh, than it is. Uh, I've never installed anything without uh, like I never installed an OS on a computer that didn't have uh, some kind of display out before, but uh, it wasn't more complicated than downloading the PineCube Arbian image, uh, flashing the image to an SD card, uh, plugging the PineCube uh, to power and Ethernet, and shabamalama, I was 99% done. An SSH server is installed by default on the image, so I simply had to... Um, Find my PineCube's IP, which I did uh, using uh, nmap. Uh, there's a, a command that allows you to see all the devices uh, on your network and uh, what their IPs are. Uh, and then I just uh, SSH'd into it and logged in using the default username and password of root in 1234. That sounds secure. Oh, yeah. Which obviously, uh, I did change. Um, it, it actually prompts you to change once you log in, which, uh, which is cool. So I just put in, uh, my usual password. I mean, my totally unique password. Don't, don't try to crack me or anything. Uh, installing, uh, Media CTL and FFmpeg was the next thing I did. Uh, Media CTL. Uh, or media control is a part of, uh, the V4L utils package and is useful for configuring the camera. And FFmpeg is, uh, well, it's FFmpeg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, writing apt install FFmpeg on, on a camera is amusing. And, well, so FFmpeg is what I used to make the video feed of the camera. To, to I took to take the video stream of the camera and I streamed it uh, via RTMP to a RTMP server, which I set up uh, next. Actually, um, I followed a tutorial 
um, that was on uh, servermedia.com. I forget exactly who writes it, uh, but we'll have a link. Um, to help me set up uh, Engine X uh, for RTMP streaming. It was simple enough once I wrapped my head around it. I never used uh, Engine X or RTMP before, so it was quite the fun new experience, which uh, I think I can say for a lot of Pine products anyway for me. Uh, it really gets me to think about Linux and software in a in a very unique way. And I learned some things I probably wouldn't have bothered to look up in the first place. Oh, yeah. It gives me problems to solve. <laughs> um, once everything was set up, I, uh, I took it upon myself to, uh, to, to, to live stream to my friends, uh, me cooking. Uh, so it was fun. Uh, it wasn't the best resolution. Uh, I forget. Uh, exactly what the resolution is. I think I actually do have it written down right over here, though. Hold on. Yeah, it's, uh, 640 by 4080. So VGA, it's not the, the, as the old, yeah, go, old yeah. people call it. VGA. Good. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I was set up with Express VGA and, uh, it was super cool. It, uh, it, uh, it, anyway, it looked nicer than the Pine Phones camera, but I don't know if that's a hardware limitation or is it a software limitation. It seems to have a larger lens body and mm -hmm. stuff, so maybe that's a reason. I've been observing the same too. The the pictures look nicer than the one the Pine Phones take, but the camera is a lot bigger here, even mm. if it's the same sensor. It has a different mm. lens, so maybe mm. that contributes. Well, cool. I mean, good job on getting a good lens for for your device for the for the device that is a camera, right? Yeah, there's a lot more space for the Pine Cube. I think that's why the Pine phone lens is what it is because well, mm -hmm. room is quite limited. Yeah, well, Google can do it. So, what's their excuse? <sighs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um uh yeah, I'm I'm definitely uh going to make some videos on the Pine Cube. Uh I think that would be uh really fun. Uh maybe I can mess around with it see if I can't get uh, TensorFlow Lite for object recognition to work on it, who knows? I mean, the processor is already running at like 80% just streaming the thing, the video. But, uh, you know, maybe it could recognize something, at least. Uh, or maybe I could do this, like, cool thing where, like, the video is streaming from the camera to my computer, and my computer uses TensorFlow on that video to do the the thing, and then it could save it either locally on uh, on the PineCube by, like, saying, hey, something moved, uh, save that. Mm -hmm. And it could save the last few minutes and future minutes, or maybe I could just save it locally on my desktop, I don't know. But I like that because uh, it's an SD card, you know, you have a, some semblance of space and the resolution is low, so it doesn't take too much space, I suppose, is an advantage. <laughs> um, and Peter, uh, I believe you had the idea of doing a live stream on YouTube or some other video platforms uh, using the PineCube as a camera. Yeah, as a face cam. As a face cam. I think that could be yeah. fun for uh, for Pine-related live streams. I, I might steal your idea there. Do it. Do it. I mean, you shared part of your setup here. If you do it then, that would help me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> just got need it. To, you know, just need to follow a couple of steps and then have to follow untested tutorials, not knowing where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Will this work? Do I have these hours to <laughs> think on this? Oh no, I uh -huh. don't. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe I could also uh, take the time to to write something on uh, on your website. What's your website again? Uh, it's l i n m o b dot net linmob dot net. Linmob stands think... for Linux on mobile. It's really stupid, <laughs> but I came up with it years ago and I've stuck to it. 
Hey, it uh, works. It's recognizable, right? Yeah. Uh, speaking of things people are sticking to, uh, <laughs> FM radio is a technology that works well, but I mean, wasn't it about to be replaced by some digital audio broadcasting standard or whatnot? Mm. Uh, anyway, we've had this question, question in the last episode that Dion then has asked on YouTube, uh, and it was, how about an FM radio back cover? So I decided to pick this as my homework and uh, f try to approach it systematically. So I first asked myself, well, how do other devices implement this? Right? How do they implement an FM radio feature? Mm -hmm. And it's often that the headset serves as antenna. Um, then sometimes it seems to be implemented within the system on a chip. For example, on devices that are powered by the MediaTek MT6753. <laughs> you don't have to remember that name. Uh, but if you want to, go ahead. Uh, and sometimes it's within an auxiliary ship like the Wi-Fi Bluetooth ship in the good old Samsung Galaxy S2. That's crazy. But this head that serves as antenna is a common denominator. Um, Sometimes it seems to be just for a regulatory reason, so it works even if you just put something in there so that the contacts are bridged. That should be a shitty antenna, but yeah, um, that's that. Um, but on many devices, the headset actually is the antenna, and if you've ever looked at FM radio antennas, there's some similarity to your good old wired headset. Now, the second question was, do we have support for FM radio on the Pine phone. Now, I was wondering about that Quactel modem last time, about EG25G. Uh, well, that doesn't seem to have support for FM radio. Then we've got that Orvona A64 chip. Well, no, it doesn't have that. And then there's the chip that does Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, the Realtek RTL8723CS chip. And f oddly enough, uh, when this solution was announced in 2015, it was alleged that it supports receiving FM radio, but it's nowhere to be found in, on the current spec page. So, hmm, we certainly don't have a driver that would support this, and we don't seem to have the hardware for it. So... You know, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, that's both in the 2.4 gigahertz range, while FM radio is around 100 megahertz. So you wouldn't be using this the same antenna for this, in all likelihood. And uh, I, 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 we discussed this in our interview with Martin, and he said, well, yeah, he didn't see anything in the PinePhone schematics that would be likely that FM radio of that ship, if it is in there, if it is even in there, could be used like that. Now, third, the original question, basically. Would the Pogopin I2C uh, bus, that's inter-integrated circuit interface, by the way, offer enough bandwidth for FM radio on the Pine Farm? Now, bandwidth is rather, rather limited, but actual hard numbers information seems to be rather scarce. It's definitely not for keyboards, right? Mm. Uh, going back to the interview. <laughs> uh, or even thermal cameras. But back to topic. So I found some tutorials for building an, M an I2C FM radio accessory on circuitbread.com. Uh, but with this hardware that's demoed there, you would still have to figure out the audio side, so you would have to implement some audio routing somehow. And uh, well, maybe you can do that over i squared c but sorry, I don't know that stuff. Thankfully, there are also some more ready-made products that have a headphone jack. <laughs> 
for example, some growth I2C FM receiver, which we've also linked in the show notes. Uh, now that looks like it makes this much more possible. So you could use this, um, make a special back case, have a second port, a second headphone jack on your device for FM radio, and then just uh, control the frequency that you're listening to and stuff like that over the I2C bus. And the rest is running on that chip. Well, yeah. I mean, you would have uh, access to an, a 3D printer most likely, and you would have to code software up to do this, but it sounds doable, right? Oh, yeah, of course. I could do that. Yeah. And then I looked into alternatives. So what if that is not your jam, right? If you don't want to have some weird thing on the back at... Uh, <laughs> Does this and you don't want to deal with I squared C. Now, one alternative is RTL SDR over USB. So there are these real tech um, thingies for TV, so TV dongles essentially, um, that have been turned into software defined radios. You could use that, but that's rather clunky. Uh, it likely requires an external power source, making the setup even more clunky. But software exists, and we have one example of an RTL SDR compatible FM player linked. Didn't try it though. And then there's a more practical <laughs> alternative, <laughs> and those are cheap Bluetooth headphones or non Bluetooth headphones that have FM radio. Uh, so you could get something like that, or there are even really cheap ones that look a bit like an mp3 player and they are just a little fm radio sometimes they are also mp3 players and you could use that because like that you don't harm your pine phone battery life and it's just uh i don't know like 20 bucks and a few grams to carry around with you so simple right oh yeah and if you're afraid of losing that, you could then glue that to the back of your pine phone <laughs> 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 to have it look really weird. But yeah, so that's my homework, and I hope you're happy with it. I think you did a great job on your research here, <laughs> no, which uh, yeah. brings us to the listener feedback. That's right. That's uh, you guys. <laughs> you guys. You guys listening. That's cool. Keep them, keep that feedback coming and ask questions, by the way. Yeah. Um, but we aren't, uh, with, uh, we haven't arrived at the questions yet. So first the feedback. Now, Dake Vilkulak wrote on Odyssey, Laura is not for sending images. Kids these days are really spoiled. What about <laughs> simple text communication and long range mesh for simple communication? It can use some kind of low bandwidth encryption. There are several projects like MeshTastic about that. So, um, listen, I know I'm a millennial <laughs> and I identify with, you know, I feel offended. <laughs> But I forgive you oh, because Meshtastic sounds fantastic. Yeah. And uh, I also know that you're, uh, that, uh, yeah, uh, obviously I was uh, more or less uh, joking about sending images because waiting four days to receive your image sounds like, uh, <laughs> sounds like <laughs> downloading a movie trailer in like, what, the 90s, 80s? <laughs> sounds like. Do di downloading an entire movie over dial-up internet <laughs> <laughs> sounds quite bad but possible mm -hmm. uh, and by the way i wasn't joking when i said uh you the only version of this podcast you could download over laura is opus mm -hmm. so meshtastic is cool yeah meshtastic is cool it's something with gps mm -hmm. so it's with positioning i didn't totally understand what it's for mm -hmm. for rural areas but yeah so they've got a real fancy website but it seems like that you need to know what it's for to fully understand it or i just had a stupid day when i looked at it mm -hmm. both is well, entirely possible 
I just skimmed it um, earlier today, and uh, yeah, it, it um, from my understanding looks like a GPS, an open source GPS um, thing, right? Because like now, if you want to use GPS, you either have to you have to like triangulate your position using like the cell towers or using uh, uh, signals from space, which I suppose oh. aren't closed source. I mean. Uh, or aren't open source but even then i suppose like if you're just listening into vibrations is not that uh, so you think it's for deal. triangulating to find out your own position yeah i okay. mean it, no, that's that what sense. i got from it anyway yeah yeah maybe i'm, I'm wrong I'm, too <laughs> if you're wrong uh please educate us and uh we will tell everybody about that in the next episode mm -hmm. after you've told us what it really is <laughs> Good. Uh, now let's continue with the listener questions. And we don't have many here, so please send some in. But uh, let's discuss this one mail that Sebastian sent in. And I summarized the first part a bit. So Sebastian used the old Jolla phone. That's the original Selfish OS phone from 2013 that has been receiving us operating systems updates until recently as a daily driver. He's a bit sad that he can't daily drive the Pine phone yet. Mm. Back when using the other phone, it worried him that the operating systems of the time, he lists Sailfish, Ubuntu Touch, and Firefox OS here, did not seem to work together. And he's worried about this uh, same fragmentation uh, for the Pine phone a bit, mm. like with distributions and all these uh, UI initiatives and whatnot. But now to his question, and it's about the first one is about compatibility of the frameworks and distributions. Therefore, I want to ask, he writes, is there a way or some projects that try to run apps that were written with one desktop framework? To run on another desktop, like running Lomiri apps on KDE Mobile. So, I think this is uh, easy to answer, but also hard to answer. So you can, or at least could at some point in time, I tried this, uh, do just that on Manjaro. So you could install a Lomiri app on Manjaro Plus Mobile mm -hmm. um, because it packaged. Uh, a few of these Lomiri Ubuntu Touch uh, apps, uh, essentially all the core apps and some more with UNAV on a later build. Um, also, QuickDit, a Reddit client, uh, can be installed from the AUR. So that's uh, one software that's available. You can run it on FOSH-based uh, distributions or on Plasma Mobile and on Ubuntu Touch. Same code, basically. The problem with this is generally that apps have to be repackaged. So you won't at least easily get Ubuntu Touch click packages to work on any other distribution, right? Mm -hmm. Ubuntu Touch apps often lack instructions for that, well, for packaging them. And some of their dependencies may not be packaged on the distribution you try to run these on. So you need to build and package these too. So it's a non-trivial effort to do so, but for Ubuntu Touch, it should be possible for many, if not all, applications because the entirety of Ubuntu Touch is actually free software and available under free licenses. Mm. This is a bit different for Safish OS. Um, there have been efforts, uh, like one by Dylan Van Asher, uh, I hope I didn't butcher your name, Dylan, um, where he has been writing something to make it so that you can port these um, apps that use the proprietary Sailfish UI layer over to Kirigami. Mm. Uh, he based that on what the Renegus, the guy who developed Pure Maps, that excellent maps application, came up with because Pure Maps, uh, if you don't know already Alta, you know, is available for Safe for sure as Ubuntu Touch and uh, 
regular Linux distributions as a flat pack. It's also packaged in Postmark address. So there are ways to port these apps over by essentially uh, replacing parts of their UI layer for Safefish. For Ubuntu Touch, this shouldn't be necessary, but you might still want to do it to have a more uniform look, maybe. So, yeah, it's difficult, but it can be done. I mean, you have the same general problems with underlying frameworks as you as you have when you uh, run uh, some KDE apps on GNOME or vice versa, that um, you have some duplication. You know, you've got KWallet and GNOME Keyring, and if you look at something like uh, PIM, Personal Information Management, uh, then we've got that too with uh, Akunadi and I don't know what those GNOME frameworks are called, but different frameworks on both sides and that makes it hard that uh, if you install a calendar app that's made for Plasma, that it syncs the context that you already set up in GNOME, right? That doesn't happen, so you have to set that up twice and it gets annoying. Mm -hmm. But overall, it's possible as long as it's free software <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and that think... goes with anything doesn't it like any desktop apps that yeah. currently aren't like able to run on a, on a phone because of their layout or just because uh they use a certain library that doesn't work on the phone it, it, yeah. it technically can be ported if anything yeah sometimes there's uh some work necessary right if a library is not running on arm mm-hmm uh, because mm -hmm. it's written in x86 assembler or something, then you <laughs> have, have a fun time. But many times, it's actually, even if it has never been tested, just to compile away. And mm -hmm. then, of course, you may do want to do optimizations to make it run well, but it might somewhat run out of the box. Mm -hmm. But that's my limited understanding, right? I'm no computer scientist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... His email, Sebastian's email goes on, and it's so he writes additionally, when I see things right, quite some apps aren't packaged for every major Pinephone distro, even though they use the same framework. So it would be even great to use the AUR on Mobian. Also, it sounds somewhat strange. <laughs> I agree. I just mean it would be great when software for a specific need wouldn't have to be written over and over again now the second part doesn't really seem to fit the first part if you ask me but uh, yeah uh, so AUR on Mobian I don't think that's a good idea I mean you can have trouble building AUR apps on Manjaro when there's been a breaking change in some underlying software mm -hmm. uh, and that hasn't been hasn't made it un uh, to Manjaro yet so, uh, yeah, you m wouldn't want to do this. Uh, you know, Debian is great and stable and all, but uh, it doesn't upgrade everything as frequently. And um, Mobian currently being Debian testing is uh, old enough to lead to many problems here. So I would advise to maybe get into packaging for Debian. Uh, I personally can't do it uh, or rely on flat packs. Mm, another alternative I'm just thinking about right now uh, would be these uh, NetBSD package those things, but I've never played with that myself. But that's said to be quite portable and enjoyable by those people who love it. I don't know. Do you have experience with package source as well oh no uh, do, do, uh, i i do not i do not yeah but you've got experience with flat packs and the yes, AUR, I do. i'm sure <laughs> that that those two i do good i yeah. use yay to uh, install things on the aur he continues there's really a lot here so second different starting points he writes, you know, there are so 
many different branches in programming. Mine are machine, machine learning and computer engineering. Not every programmer is perfect in every niche. Where are good starting points and where to find them? That would help different parts of the ecosystem. So I think this is a general question as in, you know, like, where do I start? How do I get started? How can I help out? Mm -hmm. And I think, well, there's always a lot to do. If you run into a bug, file a bug report. If there are many bug reports, try verifying those or help triangulate, or triangulation maybe. Can help with documentation, can help with metadata or other little things. Like there's a project you like a lot, but it doesn't have a desktop file or I can um, maybe help with that. Because uh, if a graphical application is supposed to be packaged, it I think distro maintainers will require that as a bare minimum for this app to be considered even. And you could also contribute to app data, XML files or something by a pull request. I mean, pick what you think is up your alley. The worst thing that can happen is that your pull request or merge request is being declined and not merged. But um, I think that's all, right? Um, helping other users. Now, all these things, I think, are what applies to everybody, uh, even those people that, like me, aren't really gifted at programming. Uh, if you can program, and I think he seems knowledgeable in some parts of uh, computer science, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's maybe like Martin said in our interview, pick something, what you need, uh, or think you need and get started with that you know just don't uh, get confused just pick a framework pick a language and dive in you know eventually you might come up with something and even if it's objectively not very good you will have <laughs> learned something and if you keep going you will eventually get quite decent at it i think so it's just a matter of finding th something that's easy enough right I, I wouldn't yet now recommend to be like, well, I will build a video chat application for the Pine phone <laughs> uh, from scratch without using anything else everyone else is using because that's all crap. And then go down that route because that sounds like, yeah, I don't know how far you'll get with that, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's too much complexity. But if it's something like, I don't know, an alarm clock, with a different user interface than the alarm clocks we have. Why not? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, as right? You've been writing your game, so you've got more experience with app development than I ever have. I think well I think for one, doing something is better than nothing, as 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 you were saying. Like like find something that that's missing and if you're the one to add it, no matter how shitty it is, it's something. And you'll be the only app that does that. Unlike an app, let's say you try to make an app for Android and you put it on the App Store, you're one of a billion. But on the Pine phone, you're going to be the only one. And well, who knows uh, what will happen. Hopefully, you're going to be the only one, right? <laughs> yeah, well, within no, time. <laughs> not, not always, right? If you're like, hey... I like GTK and I think I need a client for password store. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, that pass command. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we've got like three or four of that I've got listed on Linmob apps and there's one more I need to add. Mm -hmm. It's not even on the apps to be added list yet. So, uh, yeah, I think that we have enough of those. Mm -hmm. uh, but then if that's your thing and you don't like all these apps, maybe you can contribute to one. Mm -hmm. or fork it and make it better right uh, so mm -hmm. why not mm -hmm. eventually we will have 25 apps for that but uh, as long as everybody's happy why not there's oh. no harm yeah and so just do yeah. you do you have fun go for it go for it we believe in you you can do it something else you can do is subscribing to our mp3 feed and if you are subscribed to our MP3 feed, check out those chapter markers. 
This can be handy if you vaguely remember something we may have talked about and want to find it again, like the awesome intro of this episode. Well, no, that's not applicable, right? It's right at the start. But anyway, <laughs> uh, if you also, if you find a segment really boring, like maybe me talking about uh, FM radio <laughs> and want to skip it, chapter markers are there for you, as long as your player supports it, sadly. I'm not aware of a PinePhone compatible uh, podcast player that supports these yet, but anyway. So that can be a project for you to make here at home, you see? Yeah, just implement it in one of the existing four podcast apps or something. There you go. Um, or if you simply don't need the chapter markers because you think they're useless, save some bandwidth and use Peter's beloved Opus version. Once more, a huge thanks to NerdZoom Media for being our awesome audio producers. And that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Remember, this is a community podcast, so please leave feedback so on what we should do better. Get your suggestions in and feel free to ask questions. We are really close to running out of questions. In fact, we may have run out of questions we have some left, but answering them is basically a full episode. So if you have a little, some thing, small things you'd like to know about, uh, or just your opinion on, please do. Please do. Please. <laughs> now to do that, you can join our Discord channel, Pine Talk Podcast on Pine64's Discord. You can send us an email at pinetalk at pine64.org which is a good option that Sebastian used this episode, uh, or tweeted us. We are at TalkPine. That's the two components of our name reversed. Right? <laughs> Not Pine Talk, TalkPine. We've also joined Mastodon a while ago, and we are at TalkPine at Fosterdon.org. If you can't remember these names, just use the hashtag AskPineTalk. Also, and this is new. We now have a thread for feedback and questions on the Pine64 forums. Please put something there. Please. Please. It's still empty. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the community section and will be linked in the show notes of this episode. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>